Hello and welcome to our webinar, The Aluminum Foundry Markets. Today we are going to talk about the different foundry applications, trends in the markets, different challenges and strategies for foundries. My name is Martin Hartlieb and you can find my email address in the end of that presentation. So in case you have any questions, feel free to contact me. We have also added Jay Armstrong's email address in case you don't have it. Casting is one of the oldest manufacturing processes in the world, but aluminum is a very young metal. In 1884, the Washington Monuments cap is the first credited construction application using cast aluminum. Back then, one ounce of aluminum cost as much as the daily wage of a common worker. Aluminum was just as expensive as gold, if not more. But since then, aluminum casting has seen tremendous growth and now exceeds any other metal cast in North America by volume. Worldwide, the main market for aluminum castings are China with over 7 million tons of aluminum cast products per year, then Europe between Western and Eastern Europe about 5 million tons of aluminum castings, and then North America with about 3 million tons together, and between the US and Canada, and Canada is only about 10% of that, so most of it in the US. We're talking about a bit over 5 billion pounds per year. And then we have other Asia also with over 3 million tons of aluminum castings per year. And the rest of the world is quite insignificant. So if we look at the US foundry shipments of aluminum castings by method, by casting method, and this is data from uh, NATCA, the North American Die Casting Association, with data from the Aluminum Association. We have to be careful because not all of the statistics actually report the same number, but uh, we all know you can never trust statistics that you have not falsified yourself. So we can clearly see die casting actually represents the lion's share in the North American foundry market, followed by permanent mold and then sand casting. Now here we can see some AFS data on the US metal casting industry. And one thing that we can very clearly see is that we have a lot of consolidation in the industry over the past couple of decades. And if we look at the numbers here in the table, back in the 1950s, we can see we actually had more than 6,000 sites, so more than 6,000 foundries in North America. And this is now all metals together, but still we can see how that number is dropping. And just uh, last year, 2019, we see 1,915. So uh, from over 6,000 sites, we went down to less than 2,000 sites, which means we have a lot of consolidation. And at the same time, the other mega trend is really globalization. We have fewer, but very global players. We also see a shift in cast metals, and we can see that aluminum is actually the one metal with the highest growth rate of all. As we can see here, again, uh, with data from AFS, and these numbers are published back in uh, January 2020. So this is pre-COVID-19. So things have changed in the meantime, but while well, we believe that uh, longer term, the trend will still be uh, more or less like this. But what we can clearly see, aluminum is actually the largest casting market in North America. And this is now in uh, sales dollars, not in tons. Otherwise, uh, iron and steel would have a big advantage over lightweight aluminum but we can see it is growing especially for aluminum and now we can also see that there will be major changes in applications and in markets and uh, we will see a lot of changing also in casting technologies and we will get more into details uh, in the coming slides so the main markets for aluminum castings are first and foremost light vehicles and in light vehicles we see a lot of aluminum and until now there's really been uh, mostly cast parts. Everybody knows, of course, wheels uh, typically made in A356 and then engine blocks and heads and transmission cases. Uh, a lot of those are die cast A380 or semi-permanent mold or sand cast uh, 319 parts. And that is really the lion's share of aluminum castings. Then trucks and buses, but they only represent about six to eight percent and uh, other transportation, including aerospace, is three to five percent then consumer durables as well 
about maybe five to seven percent in machinery and equipment uh, a little more than that seven to nine percent uh, could be estimated and then we have a few others left with three to five percent so if we look at the u.s light vehicle market and there again everything has changed since covid19 so we have traditionally uh, been looking at 17 hoping for maybe even 18 million uh, vehicles and that sales now and that just obviously drops this year dramatically we still don't know exactly to what number but then uh, we hope it's going to recover over maybe the next two or three years the light vehicles have as i said been the largest market for castings really over the past decades and castings represented the lion's share of the aluminum going into uh, automobiles. Really the switch to aluminum, the aluminum penetration of this market started back as early as the 1970s. It started with heat exchangers and then uh, during the 80s we have seen more and more conversion to aluminum alloy uh, wheels and then of course we had uh, the engines switch more and more to aluminum so heads and blocks of course these are all castings and what we can see here as well most of them have pretty much maxed out because uh, we already see more than three quarters of all wheels are aluminum wheels or aluminum cast wheels and uh, it's much worse with heads and, and blocks because uh, the heads are pretty much all aluminum what could be aluminum and the blocks are 88 percent so there is not much growth potential left and we have seen that well if we want cars uh, to grow in North America we probably have to find new ways of getting and finding new markets for cars there is just a limit of uh, how much more cars we can sell per year now in the meantime we have seen a lot more development um, in other areas of the car and that started back in the early 2000s with uh, bumper beams, side impact beams, things like that. And then uh, really the growth of sheet products in uh, enclosures like hoods and doors and things like that. And the opportunity is Ducker Aluminum that really came up with this slide sees is in uh, doors and in body in white. Body in white is the car body structure and there of course uh, a large portion of this is uh, again sheet some extrusions but there can be castings as well and we'll look into that and then another trend that uh, i would really like to point out here and that's not really represented in the slide that is electrification because electrification is both a big threat and a huge opportunity for castings and we'll go more into details uh, about that but Clearly, when you think about electric vehicles, they do have wheels. They definitely don't have an engine, so they have no heads and no blocks, and uh, their transmission looks completely different as well. And so um, all of these uh, are really big casting consumers that we will lose. At the same time, batteries are heavy, so there is a big push for light weighting, and therefore we see lots of opportunities for castings uh, in the car body that needs to lighten up and then um, at the same time in new components like in battery trays or in electric motor or inverter housings and, and uh, brackets and things like that. So we'll get into more details in a couple of slides. So we will see a major shift in these casting applications. But first let's have a look at uh, the existing casting applications. Wheels, we have seen already more than uh, three quarters of uh, all wheels are aluminum, pretty much all of them uh, A356 uh, low pressure cast wheels. And that means it's pretty much maxed out there. It is quite stable. There is really not much of a threat from electric vehicles, not at all. I mean, any kind of vehicle will have uh, wheels. There is some potential in, in larger vehicles still. And the only threat that we could see right now are pretty exotic new things like the Michelin airless tire, for example. So we, we see here a few pictures and uh, they have presented that over the past few years already. I have never seen anyone on the, the street with one of those new tires, but they uh, could of course change the requirements on the rims. So the next one uh, hits in blocks and we clearly see this has been declining in terms of growth rate already. 
over the past decades, we see a trend to higher charging of the engine. We see uh, turbos and B turbos, and especially uh, with hybrids, we won't see many V12s anymore, and probably not even V8s anymore. But we can all of a sudden see three cylinder engines and highly charged ones. So the engines that we have, they will get smaller uh, with electrification. We might not see any more engines at all. Then, of course, the car body, uh, the typical structural casting that we can see there is of course the shock tower and when I talk to uh, friends of mine at OEMs they often say well uh, a shock tower casting that's already a, a commodity everybody can do that and yes of course we have seen a huge growth rate already since the well, 2000s and uh, 2010s, much more starting in, in Europe, but now also in North America. And we still see a pretty significant growth there. Uh, we still see more and more vehicle platforms switching over to structural castings. And the shock tower is already really the commodity that you can find in almost any car. But what's new is things like battery housings. And we can see here, this is really the, the big growth area right now. And we see Clearly, a lot of uh, the large players are already adapting to this new reality. So if we look at a large producer of uh, engine blocks and heads, let's uh, think about NEMAC, for example. They have seen this trend coming since a long time. Now they have become a major player in precisely these uh, structural die castings and in, in battery housings. So they have seen the trend, they adjusted to it, and I think they're doing pretty well with this right now. Now, if we have a look at the North American light vehicle aluminum content by process here, we can see that clearly in the past, and let's just look at 2012 here, we see 48% of uh, the aluminum content in a, a vehicle was actually permanent mold and sand casting. So uh, those were the wheels, cylinder heads, and, and all sorts of castings like that, mainly A356 and 319, and then another 33% uh, high pressure die casting, and that's the engine block and transmission case, and maybe an oil pan and, and things like that. And that was, uh, as I said, 33% and Pretty much all of that was A380. And now if we look at the projection for 2025, we see, uh, well, permanent mold and sand is going to shrink significantly in terms of percentage. The uh, absolute number is still growing because the uh, the total aluminum content is growing. So it's growing from uh, 164 pounds in the past in 2012 to 190 pounds per vehicle but the 48% dropping to 34%. Similar thing, uh, but not as bad for die casting. And there we see we had 114 pounds in 2012, and that's gonna grow to 146, but the percentage will be shrinking from 33 to 27%. And the reason why this is not shrinking so much is really we do see the uh, loss in engine castings, for example, engine blocks, but we see a significant growth on the uh, structural casting side. Castings are losing percentage, but they continue to see absolute growth in uh, pounds per vehicle. So here's just a different view, and that was published by the Aluminum Association by Drive Aluminum, and based on the Ducker Worldwide numbers, and we see that was just a look between 2015, uh, where castings and forging still represented 70% of all the aluminum content in the car. And then uh, already this year, we can see that the biggest growth was really in uh, sheet products, in closures, in body panels, and things like that. And uh, of course, when huge driver there was uh, the Ford F-150 with the uh, all aluminum body and Pretty much uh, all of that is stamped sheet. Now, if we look at the body enclosure parts in more detail, and uh, here again, I'm pulling out the Ducker Worldwide study, we can see back in 2012, the car body was really 84% of it was mild and high strength steel. And then 15% uh, was advanced high strength steel or ultra high strength steel. So all the aluminum together was uh, almost nothing. That has slightly changed already to 2015. And that's when the F-150 started up the first time. And in 2020 already, we see that aluminum is clearly growing. So now all of a sudden we uh, also see extrusions coming up. And we see aluminum VD castings, that's actually vacuum die castings. And we can see those are the ones that are growing the most in this area. For 
car body structures, mainly these vacuum die castings are seeing the growth. I'm not sure this is completely correct. I would say personally, you will also see some low pressure semi-permanent mold castings for uh, hollow longitudinal beams and cross members and, and things like that. So there is room for other castings as well. So here we can see the evolution of the North American aluminum content in light vehicles starting back in 1996. And we can see that really until 2012, there was pretty much nothing there in terms of body parts and uh, hardly any bumpers or minimal closures only and engine and transmission represented the major part and we can even see that really until then the engine and transmission driveline castings were growing and since then uh, we can kind of see they have been stagnating and we can see the trend uh, in the future and transmissions and driveline I think has a much better chance of staying where it is just getting slightly transformed from a currently uh, eight nine speed transmission housing to some kind of hybrid transmission housing but the engine blocks and heads they are clearly losing and we see growth really happening in closures and in the body parts. And here we have a closer look into the changes of the component weight between 2015 and 2020. And aluminum net increase has been about 69 pounds according to Ducco Worldwide. Now uh, most of that actually goes into closure sheet and body sheet so uh, that's the big winner right now and uh, a lot of them uh, as i mentioned before goes into vehicles like the f-150 but then we see that uh, we have castings and we have the big loser of course engine and transmission and i think most of it is really engine the downsizing and uh, through hybrids and even complete loss of an engine because it's an electric vehicle but at the same time we almost gained just as many pounds through uh, the body vacuum die castings as we lost these engine castings and a lot of them were die castings as well so we see a shift from conventional die casting of A380 alloys to high-tech uh, high vacuum die casting structural die castings with the new structural alloys that would almost be a wash but now uh, we can also find castings of course in the suspension and uh, in chassis and then in wheels and steering and brakes so overall I would say castings have still been able to win a couple of pounds in automotive. Here we have a, a closer look at uh, the aluminum component weight changes between 2019 and 2025. And these numbers are now from Europe and in kilos, but uh, it doesn't really matter. We can see that what's really great, the battery box, and that came out of nowhere. And this is obviously a, a huge gain here, 12.38 kilos, and that more than compensates for the loss in the engine and transmission. This trend is going on, but a lot of these battery trays are actually cast. Then we see body closures. That's typically a sheet, of course, but again, electric motor housings, uh, a lot of those are actually cast. Some are extruded products, but we can see that overall castings are winning here. And then uh, as well, chassis and body structure and even wheels are still growing quite a bit. The rest is only minimum growth in brakes, crash management, and steering. So if we look at over time, these numbers have changed quite a lot. So uh, on the left side, we can see uh, what Ducker Worldwide predicted in uh, 2014 and the rolled products as the sheet products and extruded products. Let's leave them aside and look at just the vacuum die castings. They really started, let's say, in, in 2015 here, although we had a little bit of them uh, before already. And then uh, we had they estimated back then one pound in 2015 and then seven pounds in 2020 and then um, by uh, 2025, 12 pounds. And that was the forecast that we had in 2014 and already in 2017 that was revised and the one pound actually had jumped up to three pounds per vehicle and the seven pounds for 2020 had jumped up to 14 pounds and the 12 for 2025 has jumped to uh, 19 and now we already see the prediction towards uh, well, 2028 or 2030 um, that is, will be uh, 24 pounds per vehicle. We can see the numbers are growing and then the four cars are actually growing uh, 
all the time as well. Every time we look at it, uh, we realize that, well, I guess we missed a, a couple of applications that are now adding numbers. And if we look at that back then in 2014, that was the estimated number of millions of pounds for net vacuum die castings. And we thought, well, 2015, not a lot. 2020, 126 million pounds, not too bad. And then that doubles to 2025. And the 2017 numbers uh, multiplied with the number of vehicles, they already went up uh, a lot. We see 2016 here, 45, and then 2020 now uh, more than a quarter million pounds in North America. And then uh, this is continuing to grow to 2025. And I think uh, that number will actually be a lot higher than what is here on that slide. And if we look at the different applications that we can find for high vacuum die castings in car body structures, they are a lot of different ones. I mentioned before the shock towers front and, and sometimes also rear. That is really the commodity that we can see in, in a real lot of cars, not just luxury cars. In uh, pretty much all types of cars, we can see them. The other thing, of course, these high voltage housings or battery housings, so we can see a lot of them. Cross members, engine cradles, uh, very common different types of pillars uh, sometimes even door structures all sorts of brackets and we see here on the right uh, lower side this very interesting casting there that's depending on the OEM has different names longitudinal member rear nodes whatever you want to call it but uh, very impressive castings very big and actually a lot of cars you would see them uh, not just made in high pressure die casting but actually hollow um, like here the body in white of the Mercedes SL uh, it's a very large hollow low pressure casting it is certainly a big trend towards structural high pressure die casting high vacuum die casting but there are opportunities for other casting technologies as well and then of course here comes the big question what happens to our cars and how will they look uh, in the future and how will our powertrain look like and will our engines peak soon or have they peaked already and that's actually a, a great question you will find a lot of studies on that and a lot of studies get updates very often so whatever you present here is probably outdated already when you present it and we all know that there will definitely be a, a different mix between the powertrains in the future and we know that electric vehicles will definitely grow and hybrid vehicles will grow where we have more hydrogen vehicles and other forms of uh, powertrains uh, who knows but right now i think uh, it's safe to uh, to say that electric vehicles are probably the ones that we need to have a closer look at now if we look at annual ev sales by country the united states were actually uh, at one point in time leading here but since quite some time china has clearly taken over and made this their absolute target to convert the transportation industry to electric vehicles and we can see the growth is uh, pretty substantial europe as well is pushing very strongly uh, towards electrification of uh, vehicles and uh, we now see a lot of incentives are given only for electric vehicles and things like that so countries are investing in uh, the infrastructure for it uh, charging infrastructure and we see a lot of new companies electric vehicle companies popping up and new electric vehicles and we can already see pretty much almost every type of vehicle there is a hybrid version of it already available or will be available in the next coming years now a lot of you uh, probably say this whole thing with the electrification i don't think it's going to happen so fast and of course we can debate how quickly it will happen but if we just look back a bit over a hundred years this is easter morning in 1900 fifth avenue in new york and you can see that pretty much everybody was out there uh, with horse and carriage and there was one automobile back then on the street. Now this is 1900. This next picture shows exactly the same spot 13 years later. Easter morning, 1913, Fifth Avenue, New York City. And if you're lucky, you can spot the one horse in there. So in 1900, people uh, were still very skeptical about uh, cars and I, I think if you had asked people how quickly will people switch from horse and carriage to uh, automobiles, a lot of people would have said, well, I don't think it's going to happen so fast. So I'd be careful with predictions how long uh, combustion engines will still be around and how quickly electrification will happen. So now let's have a look at the electrification of vehicles and uh, what does that actually mean to 
vehicle manufacturing? Well, we have a couple of completely obsolete components, and I mentioned that before. Of course, a combustion engine is one of them. So we don't need engine blocks and things like that anymore. We don't need pistons anymore. We don't need fuel systems and injection systems, clutches, exhaust systems, and things like that anymore. A lot of castings go into those, and they will be simply gone. Then we have strongly modified components like the gearbox, and I mentioned that before, but uh, even though it's not a traditional gearbox anymore, there will be a lot of opportunities for castings in future gearboxes, in hybrid gearboxes, a uh, gearbox that integrates electric uh, motors and things like that. You will have a very modified uh, wheel suspension and uh, overall powertrain, air condition, of course, uh, and cooling water system and thermal insulation and, and things like that. And then you have completely new components like the electric motors, of course, the electric drives, power electronics, the battery system, and uh, possibly the fuel cell system. So that will really change pretty much everything in the whole manufacturing of uh, a vehicle. So if we look at the impact of the electrification and uh, what that means for castings well here is a, is a picture of an engine and we can see uh, the engine block pistons camshaft fuel pump water pump a lot of these things that were castings and if we look at global engine launches we can already see there has been a trend since uh, quite a few years that we have less and less engine launches anymore and that is really exactly the opposite uh, when it comes to hybrid vehicles and electric vehicles. We see extensive commitment right now from most OEMs uh, and we see a lot of new launches, a lot of new brands, even new models coming out. And if we look at these electric vehicles, well, all of a sudden now we have new parts like the rotor, we have uh, motor housing motor end plates, inverter housing, um, battery monitoring system housing, so um, a lot of new components. So is the electrification adding weight to vehicles? Uh, you take the, uh, the engine out and you make the transmission lighter, but overall the electric motors are pretty uh, heavy too and uh, definitely the battery pack is quite heavy. So I think most people agree that uh, at least for the foreseeable future, battery uh, electric vehicles and especially hybrids will be heavier than conventional combustion engine vehicles. So that means there is a lot more pressure to save weight elsewhere. Otherwise, our driving range will be compromised. So that means we will see over the coming years a change in product portfolio. And we will also see competition with other materials and other manufacturing processes. We see that here, this is 2020 and uh, on the left side and on the right side, uh, 2025. So obviously, uh, a lot of things will happen uh, in those five years. We will see more pressure for light weighting independent of any conversion to electrification or anything like that but we can see that in an internal combustion engine only we see uh, in 2020 here we have 170 uh, pounds per vehicle of rod products and 290 of castings and that in five years Ducker Frontier as they uh, are called now predict uh, is still growing a little bit and uh, we see mainly the rod products will grow from 170 to 185 pounds but what's very interesting is if we look at the battery electric vehicles, there Ducker sees that the cast products will lose. So from 290 in this year, we would actually go to 228 if it's the same vehicle, but a battery electric version of it. While the rod products would win tremendously because this huge need for light weighting will pretty much come from the fact that you will add the batteries, but you switch the body from steel to aluminum. What's really interesting is what's in between, and that's the plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, these PHEVs. And there we can see not much growth for rod products because those are often kind of the same vehicles that you would see with an internal combustion engine but all of a sudden you have a lot more cast products because you still have the engine but you also have a battery housing you also have electric motor housings you just gain a lot and for us those are actually the greatest opportunity that we have in the automotive sector so these hybrid vehicles that's the ideal target for castings now you can see a lot of different predictions right now what's going to happen with the electrification and what it will do to different materials and processes and 
we can see some that are very positive in terms of what's going to happen to castings. Others are more negative. We all agree that, well, if we go from a combustion engine to here, the first column is just combustion engine. So uh, we have wheels and the powertrain. We have the same powertrain and combustion engine and structural parts. And then hybrid has a, a little less because it uses a smaller engine and then electric engine has none. But then you gain some other parts, structural parts, electric vehicle parts, and overall a lot of people actually think that casting can still actually gain. And we see here the conversion on the right side uh, from engine block to here a shock tower. This is a very optimistic view, in my opinion, that says that we'll lose 80 kilos. So this again, it comes from Europe, 80 kilos on the combustion engine, but we win 40 kilos for new aluminum cast parts for electric vehicles. And then the car body parts will actually give us a big boost plus 113 kilos. So overall, we will win quite a lot. We have seen a lot of different studies around that. So uh, I think it's probably not that optimistic, but it's also not that pessimistic. So here is another study that shows that we lose some, of course, uh, on the combustion engine, but we will gain uh, to some extent in other parts, uh, but the total aluminum content, uh, especially in the hybrid electric vehicles, will really gain a lot. And the question is, of course, well, Will the future look more hybrid or more electric vehicles? And I think right now, especially in North America, we see a lot more hybrids than uh, complete electric vehicles. And probably that's going to last uh, for quite a while. And we even see this trend uh, happening in China, that a country that's pushing to uh, complete electrification, but even their electric vehicles alone are not growing that much anymore. Even their hybrids are gaining popularity. So hopefully that's gonna happen and that should give us a big boost for aluminum castings. So here we see a couple of examples of e-mobility components, call it here, and, and then vehicle structures. And as I said before, the shock towers, rear rail, subframes, uh, things like that. And then uh, e-mobility components like uh, electric motor housing, battery housing, and uh, things like that. So there we will definitely see a lot of growth in these components. And we see nice pictures here. And you have the source here. They are originally from NEMAC in Europe. And then we see here again, that's from George Fisher. This is one of those long rails in the, the back of the car. And in the bottom, uh, an electric powertrain casting. Just to show you the sheer size of one of those longitudinal rails or beams or whatever you want to call them. This is quite impressive and uh, you need quite a big machine uh, to do that. Usually we have seen a trend with die casting machines going up. I remember 20 years ago, uh, a two and a half thousand ton machine was a huge machine and we saw the first 3000 ton machine and then three and a half thousand ton machine. And uh, in the meantime, people buy a four and four and a half thousand ton machine. And Tesla bought a five and a half thousand or a six thousand ton machine for their facility in California. And they will not just make one of those longitudinal beams uh, in the back of the car. They will actually make the whole frame uh, of the back of the car in one casting. So these were publicly available pictures that I could show here. Here are just a few more pictures. These electric motor housings are definitely offering quite some potential. And, and that's not just for high pressure die casting, but also for a low pressure casting for semi-permanent mold, because very often we need cooling to be integrated into these castings. And for that, we need lost cores. So we need uh, cooling channels to be integrated. So uh, the opportunity for different casting technologies. Here, if we look at it again, uh, with a couple more pictures, electric motor housings, electric motor drives with the internal cooling channels. For those who made it to the GIFA show last year, you could see here, this is a very complex uh, core, a very complex sand core that uh, went into this housing. And we see uh, a lot of new developments in terms of cores for making them very thin, very intricate, and still getting them out. And then housings for, for power electronics, and then uh, energy recovery components and uh, fuel cell stacks. So we see a lot of those uh, new components. Here are a few more pictures. On the left, we see a battery housing and we see 
these battery housings, a lot of them are actually cast uh, and they can be very complex as well. They are not just uh, available as casting. Of course, that's why I said before, we have competition not just from other metals from steel or from plastic and things like that we also have competition from other technologies so if we look at this battery housing you can make it as we can see here on the left as an example from george fisher as a one piece die casting on a very big die casting machine but then you can also make it as a, an extrusion intensive uh, mixed material component and the uh, center picture is actually from constellium there you can see a lot of extrusions because you can make them hollow and you can easily put uh, cooling channels into them in this case you will also have a steel sheet integrated and you have a couple of castings um, actually nodes for keeping the extrusions together so uh, there you have a few castings but then the sheet intensive version on the right this is from Novalis this is really all stamped sheet uh, nothing else and joined together and there we don't have any castings at all and here we can see a new drive line uh, including as you can uh, very well see a lot of aluminum castings and as I said before there can still be some kind of transmission housing it just looks very different and uh, it can be combined with the electric motor housing the electric motors sometimes even two can be integrated into some kind of a transmission and very likely we will have different requirements it might not be uh, the same type of castings as we had before with the A380 transmission housing. We might need more impact resistance, we might need more heat transfer capabilities, but overall still very nice opportunities for castings in these new drive lines. We talked a lot about automotive and we know that's more than 70% of the total market, but let's have a look at other opportunities that are growing for castings, for aluminum castings and one of them I find very impressive is uh, these 5G housings and they are really large castings as well, very complex with fins and honestly I thought that real casting is uh, is pretty much dead and I have myself been involved in real casting uh, and pixel casting twice in my life already in the, the past 20 years but now it's, it's coming back and uh, we see new technologies like this actually being used for these intricate uh, castings with high walls and very very thin fins and i've seen parts like this and heat sinks like this for example where you have then actually uh, wall thicknesses going down to 0.4 millimeters so very very thin walls a lot of new components precisely in these heat sinks for all sorts of applications heat exchangers for these big servers for example for the data servers for electric applications and they all have new requirements they need new alloys uh, often improved processes or completely different processes like I said the uh, renaissance of rail casting maybe and we see a lot of opportunities to actually get into new markets with new alloys and improved properties and another big trend there is of course now everything has to go green we want to lower carbon footprint and increase our sustainability so I think recycling content in many of the existing but especially also in new components is very important and people are pushing for it and always question is it possible and can we push it even more so what does all of this mean for the foundry alloy market we have clearly seen the most affected or the most threatened castings are the a380 die castings the engine blocks the transmission cases and several other engine castings like oil pens and things like like that and other uh, mostly secondary alloys like the secondary 356 and secondary 319 used in semi-permanent mold castings like in cylinder heads and other engine castings. The new applications and uh, most of them are currently more in the primary type alloys because uh, a lot of people say they are primary alloys but actually we are finding more and more you can actually make them with uh, quite a lot of recycling content and those are the structural castings that I've shown you and uh, the battery housing heat exchanger castings all sorts of new applications that we have looked at and with that A380 has traditionally been uh, really our last resort for anything that couldn't be recycled in anything else well where will all our scrap go I just read that China is once again cutting down on their import quotas for aluminum scrap and that's been our 
go to market in the past and uh, so we have more and more scrap that would normally go into a380 and the a380 market is actually shrinking so where will that go? Clearly, we need to find new ways to integrate recycling content into traditional uh, primary type alloys like these structural die casting alloys. We have already demonstrated that a lot of this is possible. We just need to be very, very disciplined and we need to improve in scrap recycling, sorting and uh, then cleaning the metal and doing a good job in making good alloy out of scrap. Of course, before we finish this session here, I have to say a little bit about additive manufacturing because, uh, well, a lot of people say, well, could this be a real threat for castings and when will that be? And well, I would say maybe long term and of course, rather for, let's say, low volume applications and maybe rather smaller applications, but I don't see additive manufacturing actually really threatening large volume, uh, let's say die casting or low pressure casting applications and especially very big ones, that will still take a while. Until then, I would see 3D printing is much more an enabler for castings and not just because you can actually make prototypes much faster with additive manufacturing, but really also because you can make molds or dies. You can print sand molds and you can, of course, print um, investment cast wax molds and, and things like that. But now we can also uh, print steel molds. We can do things that we have never been able to do before. We can print inserts into high pressure die casting with conformal cooling channels that go along the contour of the casting and give us optimum thermal management capabilities in the dies. And Honestly, in the future, I could also see that there will be hybrids. So there, there might be things that are still castings. And then on top of the casting, we do some additive manufacturing to create more variants. So I don't think 3D printing is that much a threat. I think it's much more an opportunity and enabler for castings, short and uh, long term. So with this, we are coming to the conclusions and we have seen that traditional casting applications, engines and wheels are pretty much almost maxed out uh, and will likely shrink less the wheels, but more the engines and probably transmission cases also a little bit with the electrification of the transportation sector. Engines are definitely most affected. Transmissions will see changes through the electrification and through new drive lines, but there will be still a, a lot of castings in there. Now, structural castings and the new applications for electric vehicles are definitely growing the most. And we also see new applications in new markets like heat exchangers for all kinds of applications and uh, in telecom with a 5G networks and things like that. We will see new applications will often require modified new alloys, sometimes even new processes. And uh, we will need to work on recycling and enabling recycling content in new alloys and applications. We have seen our traditional go-to alloy for anything that can't be recycled into anything else. That's A380 and it's not growing. This is a market and a volume that's probably going to shrink. So we need to find better ways to sort our scrap and intelligently recycle it into higher value applications. Sustainability recycling are becoming big drivers and aluminum castings can really offer great advantages. Additive manufacturing is currently a big enabler for new developments. We see much improved dyes, molds that can be printed uh, very quickly, time saving, and it's a great opportunity for casting. In the future, long term, they could become a threat for some casting methods, but they also offer great opportunities. And we might even see hybrids between castings and additively manufactured additions to them. With this, we are coming to the end of our presentation. I would like to thank you for staying with us. If you have any questions, you can see my email address and J Armstrong's email address. Feel free to email us and we'd be happy to get back to you. Thank you very much and goodbye.